Join Daryl McCann's and Yvette Walker each Tuesday at 4 p.m. on ABC News Radio, KMET, and Internet KMET TV for the Southern California Business Report. The show highlights successful businesses and individuals behind them. Daryl and Yvette interview the incredible people managing these enterprises that range from awe-inspiring sole proprietors to world-renowned organizations. The Southern California Business Report, Tuesdays at 4 p.m. on KMET AM, FM, and Internet KMET TV. Welcome to KMET 1490 AM ABC News Radio and the Southern California Business Report, a show dedicated to highlighting successful Southern California businesses and the people behind them with Daryl McCants and Yvette Walker. And now here's Daryl and Yvette. Thank you for joining the Southern California Business Report on ABC News and Talks, KMET 1490 AM, 98.1 FM and KMET TV with Yvette Walker and myself, Daryl McCants. In addition to our news and talk format, we sprinkle in a little quality sports live each week, including Lakers, Clippers, Rams, Angels, and, and much, much more. We are live blasting our signal from the center of Southern California, Inland Empire, Orange County, the greater Los Angeles area to our west, the beautiful Desert Empire to the east, That's Palm Springs, La Quinta, Indian Wells, on and on, and uh, Temecula Valley, all the way to San Diego to our south, the mountain communities, all the way to state line to our north. Get us clear live worldwide by going to Google Play or Apple App Store and downloading the free KMET smartphone app today. We focus each week on successful businesses in Southern California from San Diego all the way to San Luis Obispo and the people behind them serving a local population of nearly 25 million. From awe-inspiring sole proprietorships to world-renowned organizations in all sectors of our economy. Today's show focuses on the business and secrets of Southern California's real estate sector, specifically large-scale land development. And as a bonus, we're going to sprinkle in a little sports. That's going to be a, a little, uh, little bonus. Before we begin, a special thank you to our team, Mitch, Bill, and Sean at the station and our amazing advisory group from UCI School of Business, Bill Morris, Jay Kaplan, catch his show every Friday at 3 p.m., Camilla Rubio and Diana Cavalla, and James Carvin. Special thanks to last week's guest, Mr. John Chapman, CEO and president of San Antonio Regional Hospital. You want to catch that show. They have exciting things with their strategic partnership with City of Hope, Everybody knows that Yvette Walker and I, our our respect for City of Hope is off the chart. Uh, They are on regularly. And a new surprise, that little secret last week, and that is they are forming a strategic partnership with Cedar sinai and more. Make sure to go and catch that show on demand. And as customary, Yvette Walker will introduce this week's guest. Yvette, the microphone is all yours. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Daryl. I am so happy and I'm extremely honored to have the privilege to introduce to everybody today, Mr. Jeffrey Burham, Chairman of National Community Renaissance. In 1991, using his own resources, Mr. Burham co-founded National Community Renaissance, also known as National Corps, in response to the need for affordable housing in San Bernardino County. Five years later, wanting to provide more than shelter to low-income family and seniors, he co-founded the Hope Through Housing Foundation to offer programs and services that transform the lives of residents. Today, National Corps is one of the largest national nonprofit affordable housing developers in the country. Burham is a longtime affordable housing advocate. Early in his career, he was one of 22 real estate professionals to be appointed by Congress to serve on the Millennial Housing Commission, whose mission was to make recommendations for federal housing policy to legislators. During his 30 years in the development field, Burham established three successful real estate companies in addition to National Corps and Hope Through Housing. Number one is Diversified Pacific Communities, a builder of custom quality single family home communities throughout Southern California. Number two, 
Diversified Pacific Opportunity Fund, founded in 2008 in response to the market downturn and has raised more than $60 million in private capital to purchase and develop land and other real estate assets. And number three, Colonies Crossroads, a land investment group that has developed a 400 plus acre master planned community featuring more than 1,000 residential homes and more than 1 million square feet of commercial space of which Burham is a managing partner. Burham is active in the community, serving on many nonprofit and for-profit boards, and previously served on the board of Pomona Valley Habitat for Humanity and AIG Sun America's Asset Management Company. Wow. Thank you so much for joining us today, Mr. Burham. Thank you for having me. So now what we want to do and, and we ask everybody before with that resume, you know, I've already got, uh, you know, I'm already uh, overwhelmed, but let's go back and on a, uh, on some of the personal stuff, because you're, you, you've got like three different things that, that you're focused on at one time, but let's go back into your biography, you know, from the time that you decided to get into your core profession, which is development. Kind of take us what that looks like. Tell us what that looked like from the beginning and then how you got to this point. And then we'll launch off into these major projects that not only did you um, visualize, but you managed to make them happen. You know, and uh, me personally, I get to go through the world's biggest in and out, thanks to you, and mm -hmm. uh, and uh, run into Home Depot, thanks to you, and uh, see lots of beautiful homes that uh, were developed. They were medium and large and all of them very fairly priced and people have really enjoyed them and they've appreciated fantastically. So before we get into all of that, from your core profession of development, tell us where, how you got into it and bring us all the way up to current and then we'll launch into some of this other stuff. And then there's some secrets regarding some sports and uh, our general manager, Mitch, will just, uh, he'll be loving every minute of that. So let's start with the, the, the development piece. It's all yours. Well, it's uh, thank you again. But, uh, you know, I came out to California to go to school at, at back in the day. It was the Claremont Men's College. At, uh, I was the last graduating class. And uh, when I graduated, you know, I didn't want to become an accountant or a banker. So I literally picked up the yellow pages because I really always wanted to was fond of real estate, always wanted to build buildings, own buildings. And uh, so I literally went through the yellow pages and uh, called local real estate developers because I wanted to stay here in Southern California and found a gentleman that would hire me in um, the uh, Inland Empire when it wasn't really the empire part yet. It was more the Inland Valley. And so started there, got a job with him, you know, did well the first couple of years, started my own firm, um, got some Asian partners that gave me some financial backing. I actually spoke a little Mandarin from Claremont and the Pomona College um, back in my day. And so it helped me get some Taiwanese investors. And from there, you know, I started buying real estate and, and you know, did well at an early age and got lucky. Um, you know, it's a dedication to, you know, focusing on one element in my life and really um, grinding down on it. And, you know, since then, I've been fortunate enough to, you know, start some of the companies that uh, Yvette walked us through. But uh, it was, you know, one deal at a time. You know, it was from Diversified Pacific from the first time we started doing land development deals from single family homes to fourplexes. Um, then, you know, we were during the downturn. You know, I thought I had made enough money at an early age in my late 20s that I thought it was time to give back. You know, I did the census in the 1990s as one of the census counters. And, folks helping to get into the migrant worker camps found that there was a real need for affordable housing for these folks and others, teachers, firemen, and, um, you know, uh, made some phone calls, went and studied at Hunter Library in Claremont and uh, found a gentleman from Northern California that had recently started a regional nonprofit called the Bridge Housing. That, uh, and we decided at the time, we, call, we created a company called SoCal Housing. And that was the predecessor to National Corps. Because we were only based in Southern California, um, we got our nonprofit status. Then we went around to the cities that had redevelopment agencies and uh, talked them into the plan that I, I and my partner Andy Wright at the time were both raised by single mothers, 
And we really wanted to create some housing to stabilize, you know, everywhere from the migrant worker base to single moms raising their kids on their own, you know, so they'd have an opportunity uh, to advance, particularly the children. And so we started that. We're successful with partnerships with from the cities of Rialto to Rancho Cucamonga, now in Ontario. And geez, we're all over Southern California from L.A. to San Diego now. And um, we've been very fortunate. Um, cities bought into, elected officials bought into the vision that we had when we created the Hope Through Housing Foundation a few years later. We were able to help kids, you know, with after school programs. We got into senior health care, nutrition, um, you know, migrant workers, English as a second language, helping them write resumes and advance their careers past just labor. Um, we've been very fortunate uh, we've been developer of the year. As a, as, a, as a nonprofit by the National Home Builders Association, competing against the other big for-profit entities. So we've been recognized for our ability. We're the first nonprofit to not only manage their own units, but to actually to build them. Um, wow. I was a general contractor, put my license with the company, and uh, we started bidding out projects and building them ourselves. And it was, it's been important in that economic model for me coming from the private sector that it learned to sustain itself. So you didn't have to live off of grants and, and, and donations every year. So I created a model where it had a sustainability from the property management fees and the developers fees of building the projects. And today it's you know, net asset base is over $2 billion. It's, a, it's probably obviously the, the thing I'm most excited about what I've done in my life and my career. Obviously I've, had to do it in the private sector as well to be able to afford to do all that as a as a volunteer chairman at the organization. But uh, we've been fortunate why we're doing that to be able to have partners that help me uh, continue to build single family homes and shopping centers. And now we're venturing into the apartment business. But we've been very fortunate. That's uh, you know one of the things I was really looking forward to to hearing is something you know very inspirational for for young people that are you know. Obviously, uh, you know, many people now listen to all the radio. Radio is still the king, by the way. King, radio is the king. So people in our Southern California region spend about an hour and a quarter each way oftentimes uh, commuting to work and back, you know, each way. We have the third largest population of millennials. And uh, your description of how things moved along, I tell you, uh, Anybody out there that is really excited about going into real estate, you know, you, you just really spelled it out. You know, we'll go to that a little deeper later. But just the fact that you pick up the yellow pages, everybody thinks everything is so glamorous, but it's really funny. We just uh, we hear that again and again as to, you know, how did people you know come about this? Uh, we had uh, a few weeks back, the curator from SeaWorld just moved into San Bernardino County to run the uh, Big Bear Alpine Zoo. And, you know, how'd you get this gigantic position? And, you know, you had Shamu over there and now you got grizzly bears. And, you know, and he shared with the audience that, uh, you know, there was a girl I was interested in. She worked at this SeaWorld looking uh, park in Florida. So that's how I got into it. And now all of a sudden, you know, you know so between him and, and how he started and got to his, you know, uh, high level position and you starting with the yellow pages is, that's just classic. That's just classic. And that, is just as true today as, as ever, don't you think? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, any entrepreneurial business, I mean, look at all these folks that are creating these apps these days. I mean, these are all just ideas, but it requires you to have the initiative to come up with the idea and then to grind it out. And yep. so I think there's as much entrepreneurialism in our country today as there was 50 years ago. It's, it's I mean, that's the wonderful thing about our country. We really foster the the thoughts and of the youth and 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 obviously following their dreams and and you know that absolutely and by the way for people who just tuned in we are here with jeff burham and uh you will find out his uh background here uh, in development here in southern california taking on uh in particular we're going to talk about one particular development that uh you know, involved everything from the federal government to the state co to government to the county to the city. And, uh, you know, it's a testament to entrepreneurialism, uh, having the ability to take on very large risk. And, uh, you know, those people that can take on very large risk, you know, they're, they're rare and see things through. And, uh, and on that note, 
right now on the development side, uh, uh, share with our listeners the the name of the entity that's most active right now in, in, in terms of just development, because I know you're going to talk more about that shortly. Which is the most active uh, uh, group that you have right now? Well, Diversified Pacific is my main company that I build homes and land entitlements throughout Southern California. We own you know, uh, thousands of lots and we have been building homes and now we're moving to planning and building apartments, you know, to um, meet the needs of the, the, the area. The, you know, the Inland Empire is evolving rapidly and many of us believe these mixed use developments where you have the ability to live, work and play um, and walk to the facilities from your home are key to the future. Um, I, I know y- Yvette lives in one of those communities and she understands the ability to, you have a, a baby, you can get in a stroller and literally walk around the open space and get to the local shopping center, get a cup of coffee, get your laundry, um, go to the pharmacy. Um, that's really the future of the sur- suburbs. And, you know, the, the Inland Empire, it, you know, has always been the home of the least expensive single family homes in Southern California. But candidly, the cost of housing is rising so high that uh, many of the, the the young professionals just don't have the ability to put down $100,000 to, to buy a new home. So we really need to create first class quality. And it's been started here in the last few years of first class apartments where people can live like they're living in West L.A., you know, in a multi-story building versus these old garden walk-ups that we've had in the uh, fire forever. Right. And can you... Can you share a little bit about what those amenities are going to look like in the developments that you're talking about? Well, I mean, you know, most of these facilities these days, you know, have the standard pool and gyms of, of old. But you're going to start seeing, you know, we, we have a, a, an eight-story project being planned or is planned and approved at the colonies. We're hoping to get under construction here in the next year that literally – the pool side has cabanas with cabanas that have TVs inside them. It has indoor and outdoor jacuzzis and dry saunas. It has a theater room. Um, it has a wine cellar for, for members of the community to both store wine in a secure location. It has a cigar room. It has has a uh, business center, a conference center. Um, it's, it's really designed um, with a concierge that you can now get your laundry and groceries dropped off at stored until you get home from work. It, it's the idea of, of being able to live as a professional and, and with all the conveniences that you need in your life. Wow. <laughs> I want to move in one of those. <laughs> they sound so beautiful and so convenient. I mean, with those amenities that, you know, maybe don't take up your actual square footage of your own home, you can not worry about the upkeep, the maintenance, any of those things. Just be there to enjoy them and focus on living and working and enjoying your family. That's just, that's a phenomenal model. I am really excited so many, about that. So many people in an empire are used to buying houses with lots of yard and land and, you know, for their dogs and their kids growing up. But as they age, you know, they, they, they still want to live in the Illinois empire. Right. And so they don't want to have to move to somewhere else to have a higher quality of life. The ones that can afford it, we all know, move to the beach, they move to West LA, Beverly Hills. But our idea is to try to create a product that's someone that has made money and wants to still live around their family and friends they've developed over their career. Give them a place that's that's nice enough that even though they're giving up the yard. They're not going to give up the quality of their kitchen. They're not going to give up the quality of their living style. You know, they're going to, it's going to have enough parking in the underground parking so they can have multiple cars. Um, it's really designed to keep them here, but in a higher lifestyle. I imagine the social element has got to be something that's very enticing and attractive for these people as well, you know, because when you live in that setting, you can't help but be social and develop friendships and have that community where, you know, you can just walk down to the pool and have, you know, a nice drink or sunbathe with your friend from down the hallway, you know. Yeah, it's it's really an evolution of you know the in, the urban area really moving to the suburbs. That's where we're going with the mass transit corridors that we're doing. You know, with the uh, people working from home now, not having to commute into Los Angeles or Orange County as much anymore. 
really trying to create a higher quality of life, but in in, a, in an environment where they can afford and they they can you know maintain their 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 unit, their living condition, their home in a much easier fashion than they've had to in the past. I tell you, I think you're on the right path completely. The, you know, when you go down into you talk about uh, the West LA area, there's thousands of beautiful luxury apartments and you ask somebody well, how long have you lived there oh 30 years 20 years you know there's that, that some of them are a thousand square feet some are many thousands of square feet they wouldn't think about living anywhere else you know they travel some of them have homes in different parts of the country and uh to see really high quality luxury multifamily just gorgeous that you see in West LA and you see in different parts of Southern California to see you take that leadership role, which, uh, you know, obviously when you put that in the colonies, that'll be extremely unique. It'll be the first of its kind in that colony's entire development. Correct. It's, it's going to be the only thing of its kind in the Inland Empire that's created so far in a, you know, downtown Riverside's done some things with lofts and rentals, but these are going to be condominiums where folks can buy and own themselves. Um, it's it's really going to be the crown jewel of the uh, the colonies project when it's finished. Beautiful, beautiful. And I, I tell you, the uh, event walker and I, we just got a little secret. We always try to pull secrets out of our guests. And we got a secret out of uh, the mayor there in Ontario, Mayor Leon, that a five-star hotel is on the horizon right near the Ontario International Airport where there's obviously the sports arena, the convention center, you know, hundreds of amazing businesses over there from UPS to FedEx to Amazon to many, many manufacturers. And so for you to have under under development, something that everybody could be very proud of, come from anywhere in the world and come and take a look at this and say, you know what, I couldn't be more proud to live here. And I'm not even thinking about leaving. You know, this is, you know, I can go downstairs and have a cigar. I can go upstairs and, and, and enjoy the pool and the barbecue and, you know, and have a little wine cellar over there. You know, because oftentimes what I've noticed is uh, people would love these amenities, but they don't make sense just for one person. Like, you know, I don't need a jumbo jet. You know, I can go down there and jump on Alaska or Southwest or whoever, and I'm perfectly fine. I can have other people on the plane. doesn't need to be just me. So, so when you build these amenities and people go, you know, that's great. I just have a few bottles of wine. I don't need to build a 500, you know, bottle cellar, you know, just, just enough for, you know, their particular needs. So you get such great economies of scale with that. And uh, now you hit on another one of Yvette Walker and I's favorite themes. Uh, we couldn't be more proud of the Inland Empire. And, and you and others have talked about the Inland Empire of a decade ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, you know, people don't realize it took a couple of decades to get Newport Beach up and running. You know, very brave developers like yourself went over there and built it, hoping somebody would come. And it took decades to get Newport Beach off the ground. You know, it was a very ambitious development. Now we look at it, go, oh, you know, it's wonderful. And, you know, and, and uh, but it had a very, very challenging initial rollout, we'll say. So as you talk about uh, the Inland Empire, you have a a real feel for where things are, where they've been, where they're going. Spend a minute and let's talk about where you see, before we go to break, where do you see the Inland Empire, Inland Empire now? Where do you see it going? Where do you see the strengths of it? You know, for those that are listening all over Southern California, often Yvette and I, we just look at this as neighborhoods. You know, it's now one large population. People wake up in the morning in one neighborhood, call it L.A. County, and drive to work in another neighborhood called the Inland Empire, and then they go visit their best friend in another neighborhood, Orange County. So they're little neighborhoods, you know. So it used to be this is way over there, and that's way over there. and It's really interesting how it's just become one nice, cohesive area with these different neighborhoods. One of the neighborhoods we call the Inland Empire. G give us your thoughts, because you have a much better understanding, and you're seeing things that you know, Yvette and I don't see, and you're involved in things that, you know, you're today thinking about things that we're all going to be able to enjoy and see over the next one, three, five, seven, ten years. So what say you about the Inland Empire? You know, the Inland Empire is, you know, is is evolving to its own sustainability. You know, we've always been a bedroom community for, you know, 
at least the the first from the 1980s to you know at least 2000 uh you know people lived out here generally commuted but what we're you're finding as we grow three and a half million to five million people is we're going to be your own sustained community we're going to be your own you know statistical metropolitan area that is going to have everything you know from sports teams to um, hospitals that we have, you know, Virgin and Atlantic trains. It's talked about coming from Vegas to the Ontario airport. Uh, we're going to be a hub of, you know, activity in our own right so that the, you know, frankly, the LA and Orange County people will be committing to our facilities to, to enjoy. Um, we have so, you know, it's going to, as we grow, I mean, it's almost, we're almost solid homes as it is from here to the past, the, you know, Redland to Kaipa. And so as we grow, we're going to be creating more mass transit. We're going to have higher density mixed use projects. We're going to be creating new things. You know, Victoria Gardens Mall is an example of that, that was created, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, where we, you know, we have the mills, you know, we have the largest Amazons and, you know, projects being built. Um, our population base is going to be about creating our own economic employment centers um, from anything you can name, from, you know, uh, uh, you know, CPA firms to truck distribution companies to manufacturers. You know, we're, it's, 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 we're not going to be that bedroom community in another 10 to 15 years that we've been historically. Yep. No, we're, we're hearing that, uh, uh, over and over again, and it's really, uh, you know, it's fascinating to see. Uh, it, we were joking with Mark Thorpe out the Ontario International Airport, the CEO. He was, you know, we have a airport, we have a truck port, we have a rail port. You know, all, all the manufacturing. It's a job generator, and there's many areas in Southern California where they have seen jobs move out of state. They've seen jobs move out of the country. And the Inland Empire is is really creating not only jobs, but great jobs. Filling, you know, number one in the category under many different income brackets where people can get a job and look forward to having a beautiful career, you know, living in a property that you're developing, going down to the Starbucks that you just facilitated uh, opening, you know, go over to Home Depot, have some fun. So, you know, it's really interesting, as you said, that it's becoming so self-contained in all of the above. So when we get back, we are going to dig deep into some exciting things we haven't talked about, and we're going to touch on some sports, and we're going to go a little deeper in the land development. Thanks for listening. Ontario International Airport is on to a better way to fly with over 65 daily non-stop flights to more than 20 major destinations and the easiest airport experience in Southern California. Visit flyonto.com slash Ontario to learn more about Ontario International Airport today. Join our Promise Scholars Golf Tournament on Friday, September 17th at beautiful Los Serranos Golf and Country Club, benefiting and supporting students to increase college and career readiness for underserved children. We introduce kids to opportunities available after high school and ensure they get on the education pathway to achieve their goals. Visit promisescholars.org and sponsor, play, or both to support the children in our region. Join Daryl McCann's and Yvette Walker each Tuesday at 4 p.m. on ABC News Radio, KMET, and Internet KMET TV for the Southern California Business Report. The show highlights successful businesses and individuals behind them. Daryl and Yvette interview the incredible people managing these enterprises that range from awe-inspiring sole proprietors to world-renowned organizations. The Southern California Business Report, Tuesdays at 4 p.m. on KMET AM FM and Internet KBT TV.
The University of Laverne is rated first in California for alumni satisfaction. Learn more about accelerated programs offered online and on campus in Laverne, Irvine, Ontario, Burbank, or College of the Canyons. Visit go.laverne.edu. The University of Laverne. Go.laverne.edu. Being sued and don't know who to turn to? The insurance company won't defend you and your family in a lawsuit? Stress no more. Call the Walker Law Group. We are the law on your side. Just call 909-989-3200. 909-989-3200. Take KMET 1490 AM with you everywhere you go by downloading our free smartphone apps found on the KMET website, kmet1490am.com. You can also go to the Google Play Store or the Apple App Store on your phone to download the free app. Now you can listen live or play any of your favorite programmers' podcasts using your smartphone. Go to kmet1490am.com and download your free phone app today. And thank you for joining the Southern California Business Report with Jeff Burrow. And uh, among other things, diversified communities, national core, and then soon we're going to be talking about his secret that uh, involves sports. We'll be on that in just a minute. But we want to talk a little bit more about the, the excitement of Inland Empire and what counties that you're excited about future developments. Understand we can't really talk about the specifics because they're in different stages of approval, but what cities, what counties are are you seeing uh, in the future? You know, we are uh, excited about it. You know, most areas of, of the IE, you know, we have projects. I have a big project in Banning. Um, you know, Banning uh, is the uh, lowest income city in Southern California. Um, you know, it hadn't had a new home built for 17 years, so about six months ago. Wow. And we've really focused on trying to help that community. We have about a 3,500 unit community that we're planning out there. Um, they're trying. We're trying to help with the infrastructure to get a new, a brand new state of the art movie studio um, built out there at their airport um, to help bring that community back. Um, we're, you know, we're. We've been building in Redlands. We've been one of the largest builder in Redlands for the last 10 years. We have some nice projects planned out there from historical homes that we're renovating with, you know, uh, they're on HGTV and um, with uh, Brett Waterman and his program. And we're trying to design historical homes around, you know, the the same theme of the new homes around the historical home um, architecture. Um, We're looking at some multifamily there. Multifamily from there to Highland, where we've been building, to Rancho Cucamonga, to Ontario. Um, you know, Ontario is is the behemoth of the Inland Empire economics to me, with the airport and Ontario Mills and so many opportunities that they have. You know, it it would be remiss if a developer like myself weren't building in in Ontario. It's just a, it's such a vibrant city, and they have such great leadership there. Um, the Mayor Paulion there, and Alan Wapner, and and the rest of the council are just, you know, pro development, you know, pro anything to to keep the inland empire growing. So it's phenomenal. That's great, and that's what it boils down to: is the leadership that has the vision to continue the economic powerhouse that is the inland empire now. And as you said, it. The, at the core of it, it is Ontario with the International Airport, with the Toyota Arena, with, you know, major shopping destinations like the mills, uh, major distribution channels, you know, via air, land, freight, uh, with all of the major freeways intersecting just right over Ontario. <laughs> so it's really exciting to hear about all of your future developments and your Eye on sustainability and looking forward and anticipating what our region is going to need moving forward. So, you know, that is just awesome. But going back to National Core, I just wanted to really touch on and dive deep on what it was that motivated you to go into the development of affordable housing paired with programs aimed at propelling families to their highest potential. And to me, that is the the big key. You know, it's one thing to offer affordable housing, quite another to, you know, pair that with programs aimed at education, you know, uh, to really 
propel those families to the next level and um, maybe get them out of the affordable housing um, segment. So can you please talk to what your experience was or what it was that really motivated you and also maybe share a story about a family that that has stayed with you, a family that you were able to assist um, through National Corps? Well, we've got so many great stories with the National Corps and what we've done in communities and families. I mean, from one of the very first projects in Rialto, when we took over a, a neighborhood called the Glenwoods, which was a drug um, fourplex neighborhood that was in foreclosure in the, you know, the early 90s, and we turned it around with the city and put families back in, in the complex. And, you know, we sell the same, some of the same families living there today. We have kids that started with us when they were, when they're, when they were born, um, literally. And one of, you know, one of the kids we just helped with a scholarship to get, go to Notre Dame, you know, that was in our after school programs. Um, you know, we do, uh, with, you know, what I, what I am fortunate to do is I, because of the different companies I have, I'm able to do things with both the for-profit and nonprofits. For example, at the hall, at the colonies every year, at the holiday time, Times, we do what's called um, uh, the colonies holiday miracles and we bring in not only national core and a hundred of their kids we get the local um, organizations children's fund house of ruth stevens hope leroy's boys home most of the charities in the valley we have them bring their kids in we give them um, a uh, 200 uh, dollar uh, shopping card um, that we get Dicks and Target and Kohl's to give 25% discounts for that day. And they have dedicated registers. And these kids get to go in and buy $250 worth of gifts for themselves and their family. In addition to that, we give them a tree with all the ornaments on it. Uh, Albertsons at the Colonies donates an entire meal, turkey dinner with stuffing and vegetables and breads and, and um, you know, uh, and recently, I've gotten my good friend, um, Chris Lego from Mark Christopher Chevrolet, for the last four or five years, they've actually, what we've had them do is the nonprofits, we get them to have families write us letters. And my kids and I sit down and read these letters. And these letters are about what, why their family needs a car the most. Mm. And so um, the stories that are so heartbreaking that you hear um, one of my favorite is um, uh, we had a young 18 year old girl that wrote us about needing a car because she had bought a car for $250 and it broke down and they don't have the money to fix it. And she was the guardian. She's of her two 16 year old twin brothers. Um, when we, And that's all she said in her letter. You know, but because of what we do, we go through it and she needed the car to be able to take her brothers to school and for her to be able to work part time while she was going to community college. And um, so because sometimes not all these stories you always get are true, you know, we do background checks and we look into it to verify that, that the person that we're giving the car to is deserving because we give them a car, we pay for the taxes and we give them um, a year's worth of gas, one of the ARCO my good friend Bill Angel, the ARCO, gives them, you know, five hundred dollars, thousand dollars worth of gift cards so they can go there and get gas for free. And so we look into it, make sure it's legit. When we looked into this young lady, we to find out how she's an 18-year-old guardian. We find out that they lived in Vegas and that actually her mother was murdered by her boyfriend. Oh. And 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 this girl was 17 years old when it happened. And they were all being dispersed into the foster care system for 15 year old brothers. They were all being separated, but she got a great social worker that said, listen, at 17 years and six months, you can technically apply for guardianship under the, under the law in California. They moved to California. She applies for guardianship, gets guardianship of her two, two brothers that she now was living in an apartment in Corona. Um, you know, one of our, and it's just, and, and when we gave them that car that day, the expression on their face, Yvette and Daryl, you can't replace moments like that in life. I mean, uh, it will stick to me for the rest of my life. I can, it, I can imagine. I mean, moments like that must just bring you tremendous joy and chills. I'm getting chills just listening to this story. You know, I mean, how overwhelming, what a terrible, awful situation to come out of, but to have, you know, a social worker to guide 
this poor family through and people like you to help, you know, give them something to continue their journey in a way that can keep their family together. It just it's overwhelmingly beautiful. <laughs> so thank you for everything that you do in the community, especially for those that need it most. Well, it's, 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 you know, it's, it's moments like that that give you the energy to keep doing it to the, you know, you know I, we, when we first started in Rialto, um, you know, it's these back in the day when we got started, you, we, the cities only want to do the challenge communities with us. Now we get to design these beautiful things like we're doing out of Waterman Gardens in San Bernardino, I mean, where it was a real challenge community, but now we can, you know, we, we move families around, we build new facilities. And by the time we're done, it's an entire new, you know, 1500 unit community, which is wonderful. But back in the day, you know, in the Glenwoods, I will tell you when the gangs and the prostitution are going on, they don't like you take it over. Those communities. I mean, we've been shot at inside buildings before when we're doing inspections. And those aren't days that you get up and you say you want to do this anymore. But the days where you see the expressions on the kids that you help, the, the, the boy when he got into Notre Dame and the, and the pride he showed us when he brought us his acceptance letter. And it's, you, can't, you can't replace days like that. Oh, wow. How amazing. That is absolutely incredible. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. So, you know, in, in addition to that community involvement through National Corps, you also own a local professional soccer sports franchise called the Ontario Fury. And the Ontario Fury plays out of the Toyota Arena in Ontario, centrally located again in a powerhouse, an economic powerhouse here in the region. Um, can and also, of course, congratulations on recently being a part of the MASL Ron Newman Cup. Um, can you talk about the level um, of play and the amount of work that goes into uh, managing a professional team like that and getting them to that championship? Well, what I can tell you is, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a... A relatively new sports owner over the last six years. And I had a partner that ran this great family, the Lillois family. He was a former player, started the franchise, really didn't have the economics to sustain it. Thought it was as a, as a sweet holder at the arena, became a fan the first year they opened because uh, it's just an incredible sport. If someone hasn't seen indoor professional soccer played at the quality that these professionals play these days, because the level people don't understand the level of player we get are the level, you know, we have a player that was right out of college, um, got on our team and got picked up by LAFC, played for, for LAFC for two years now is at U, uh, DC United. Um, and they come when they're coming out of MLS because we pay well, they now we get players coming out. Landon Donovan played for a competitor at, San Diego Soccers. We had Jermaine Jones on our team for about a year and a half. Um, you know, it, it's it's very, very high quality soccer. And it's frankly, for me, my kids, have, you know, I was a fan of soccer because my both my kids play. My son plays at UCR. My daughter plays for Claremont High. You know, I, I, as, I was a soccer parent. Yes. And so when they, when they started playing at the arena, we went because we had a suite. We wanted to see the game. Fell in love with it. And so unfortunately, the pandemic you know, the little was because it's, it's really a community um, project. Um, you know, we, I got involved and as we've got more involved, got national core involved. It's really about not only the players on the team and these players, you know, they're not out, you know, they're not making 200,000 or $300,000 a year. Like the low end MLS players are uh, some of these kids literally in this league get paid a hundred dollars a game. You know, some, some guys make, you know, eight, nine thousand, ten thousand dollars a month and get in apartments. But the average player, you know, is probably 26 years old, you know, went to college, played, was an all-American in college, is looking to, he's still trying to play, still trying to make it to the MLS. So we're, you know, a, a transitional sport team that they can play with us until they either make it or they don't. Um, but what we've really gone out and done at the Ontario Fury um, with with my involvement is said, we're going to be a community franchise. We are going to bring these young soccer players that have such enthusiasm and they and they are such a demographic profile of our kids. I mean, you know, it's it's pri primarily a Latino sport, you know. Um, and so we have these great young men 
that love to teach soccer. So we have a Fury Young Youth Soccer Club now. Um, we have these boys that are going to the schools, um, trying to get, you know, kids into sports because from my background and my own experience with my own children, you get kids into sports, they don't get in as much trouble. Um, and so, you know, my mantra is, you know, let's go teach these kids the most exciting game that there is. And indoor soccer to me is the most exciting sport. I grew up a football and basketball fan. I'm a, you know, Washington football club growing up in the Beltsville, Maryland area, um, watching the, the original Redskins play, um, and a Lakers fan. And so I love this, you know, football and basketball, but I'm telling you, there's nothing more exciting than watching indoor soccer. And these kids have really dedicated themselves. We've gone to a level where we've tried to bring an organic team building to our team. So we bring in all mostly local players. We bring in some from the outside to help augment, you know, the quality of the play. But um, we're a real team. We go off to the mountains, run the mountain roads together for the season begins. You know, uh, we had our season in after we lost in the finals this past Sunday. Brought my whole team to Red Hill Country Club. We sat around for eight hours and talked about the season and the commitment we're all making to the next season. And I can tell you, it's the first time in our franchise history, every single player can't wait to come back and play again because we were one bounce of a ball from winning a championship. It, we, we played that well this season. We are the team to beat in the MASL. And I think most of the franchises know it. They're oh, fantastic. That's great. They're excited. They're fun to watch. And they're really committed to our community. Going to the local schools, going to the local AYSO clubs from Upland to Rancho to Corona to the high desert. These kids go out there. They put on soccer clinics. They help teach these kids. And my goal is for them to inspire these kids to do something besides sit at home and play these video games. A lot of kids like to do these days. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And, you know, myself, I'm not a huge sports spectator, but I have been to many Fury games. And you can't help but get drawn into the excitement and the emotion of the plays that your players, you know, have on the field. There's not one moment where there isn't some kind of action going on or some, you know, suspense of a goal making it through or being blocked. And, Quite frankly, when you are at the Toyota Arena, because there are just over 10,000 seats, there are no bad seats. Wherever it is that you are, whether you're sitting in a seat or you're in the concourse or you're enjoying a beer there, um, I mean, there's no bad seat. You are in the game and it's exciting, it's engaging, and it's a great way to spend some time as a family or on a date or, you know, even by yourself if you, if you want to go watch a great sport that's local. So, um, you know, th those are all great, great assets for our community. And especially given the fact that the players are so engaged and entrenched in our community, you know, teaching soccer clinics, going out to schools and really inspiring um, our youth to look towards sports as a way to engage and stay out of trouble. You know, I'm a mother of three and they all went through soccer. I'm a total soccer mom. So I can definitely attest to the excitement of the sport and the importance of keeping, you know, kids healthy and engaged and motivated. So um, you know, just so, so excited about the Fury being local and especially uh, with you at the helm leading um, the team to really give back to the community, but also to play at the highest level possible. And I really hope and pray that you guys are going to get the championship next year, but we will stay posted and follow and make sure that we are there to support you. For those that just tuned in, we are here with Jeff, now this is for your family, Durham or Burham, okay? So when he goes to his family reunions, uh, he gets in trouble if we don't pronounce his name correctly. So we're giving you both pronunciations. And as Yvette Walker just said, uh, not only are we excited about the Ontario Fury, but another secret is uh, uh, you are taking on a different role, we understand, going forward with this uh, professional team. You want to share with that uh, before you were on the board of directors and now you're going to be uh, a little more hands on. Do you want to just give us a little detail on that? Well, I mean, because it's a challenging, you know, sport economically, um, you know, my partner, 
Ernie Lillivan is, and his wife moved to um, um, Las Vegas. So I've taken it over at the head of the club now as the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the managing partner. And so we've really gotten in this last year and hands on to where we're literally doing team building with them, sitting around in rooms, helping them. You know, I can't teach these boys how to play soccer, Daryl, but I know how to build teams. I know yep. how, you know, uh, I have a reputation and, you know, I got a lot of flack from fans the night before the final, the championship game for over two days. And I let go arguably the, the best player on my team the night before the last game, because in my world, as my dear friend that passed away recently always told me, Jeff, Tommy would say, Tommy Lissard would say, you play for the name on the front of the jersey, not the one on the back. And so, I, you know, I tried to instill that in this team and I've let go three different times, arguably the best player on my team over the last five years when I saw them becoming more important than the rest of their teammates. When they, for you. And so we, we are trying to instill a culture in the Ontario Fury that we are about community. We are about supporting each other and we're about helping to inspire young kids and if we can win championships doing that, we can create the best culture in this country for any sport. Well, I think you've got amazing vision because back in the 60s, the NFL players had jobs. They were plumbers and accountants and so forth, made very little money, very little money. So as you share the current reality um, of, of professional soccer, I think you see the vision because obviously soccer around the world, whether it's Latin America, the African continent, Europe, it's amazing how big soccer is. And uh, I think that uh, you got your, your finger right on the pulse. I think you're going to see uh, some amazing things because it's, you know, it is such a dominant sport worldwide. And to see you get behind it, having it right out here, as Yvette Walker said, right out here at the Toyota Arena, you're passionate about it. You know how to build teams. You know how to build organizations. And uh, you're one of my heroes as a developer. Any successful developer, I want to run up to them and get their autograph yeah. because people have no idea. The risk is immense. It's absolutely immense. And when things go right, everybody's a genius. But when things go wrong, boy, it can really get tough. Hey, just a, so, so we don't run out of time, uh, uh, give a shout out on uh, as you built your team on your both national core and on diversified communities. Uh, give us a little peek at some of those amazing people on your teams there as well that, uh, that, uh, that, that uh, have really helped you build this organization as big as it is. And then obviously going further, it's going to be a lot bigger. Give, give us some of those names. Well, listen, it, I mean, I, 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 I'm also of the old school where you can only be as good as the people that you hire around you. So at National Corps, that's a living testament. You know, a, uh, a gentleman that's running it today that is the uh, president of the company, um, Steve Pontell, has done a phenomenal job um, um, not only running the company, but bringing in other talent like Michael Wayne, um, you know, as the uh, main operating officer, Daniel Lorraine. Um, who runs the property management division, my dear friend of my wife's best friend for 45 years that came in as my secretary, that's now the vice president of operations and head of HR, Dory Bryant, is tremendous in inspiring people, just as a wonderful lady. Um, Greg Bradbird, who runs the Hope for Housing Foundation, he's just brought in such talent across the board. It's, un it's unbelievable. You know, uh, I, I've got my daughter um, inspired to study nonprofit management because she's been, you know, following National Corps since she was a child. She created a club called uh, Kids for Hope um, at uh, Claremont. And, um, it's just, you know, it's it's by far the mo thing I'm most proud of. Uh, you know, my partner, Matt Jordan at Diversified Pacific Communities has been with me since uh, uh, my one partner, Andy Wright, uh, retired, who did help me start National Corps. Um, and he's done a phenomenal job. But, you know, I, but I can't be more proud of the National Corps team. Thank you all so much for joining us. And thank you so much, Mr. Burham, for being our guest today. For everyone listening, don't forget to look for us on 
Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, and Instagram. Check us out on scbrtalk.com and don't forget to download the free live streaming app on Google Play or the Apple App Store. Check out our YouTube channel and download our interview with Joe Wallace, CEO and Chief Innovation Officer of the Coachella Valley Economic Partnership. He's a technology entrepreneur who arrived to the Coachella Valley to start the Palm Springs iHub. With degrees or credentials from Stanford, Harvard, Evansville, and MIT, plus a dozen startups under his belt, Joe values common sense business solutions that are rooted in scientific analysis. He chose engineering and entrepreneurship over his early goal of becoming a rock star. His first book is Living Outside the Box. Coachella Valley Economic Partnership serves innovators and entrepreneurs at every stage of business, from incubation to launch to daily operation. The organization manages the Palm Springs iHub, the Business Services Center, and organizes a robust schedule of professional training events. Next week, we will feature John M. Pacheco. Admitted to the California Bar in 1984, John M. Pacheco began his legal practice at the law offices of Rose, Klein, and Marias. In 1994, he joined the law offices of Garza and Reyes, and in 1995, the law office of Garza, Garza, and Pacheco. In 2001, John was appointed to serve as a superior court judge in San Bernardino County. His assignments included criminal law in Joshua Tree and presiding judge in Rancho on an array of cases, from civil, traffic trials, preliminary hearings, family law, guardianship, unlawful detainer, civil harassment, and small claims. Since 2011, John has presided in the San Bernardino Civil District, assigned to civil jury trials, bench trials, preliminary hearings, and occasional criminal trials. Outside of the courtroom, Judge Pacheco has served the legal community through membership and leadership positions, numerous professional and advisory groups, including the Joseph B. Campbell American Inns of Court, the Inland Empire Latino Lawyers Association Board, the Access and Fairness Advisory Committee for the California Administration of the Courts, where he served as co-chair of Racial and Ethnic Fairness Subcommittee, the State Bar Council on Access and Fairness, the California Interpreters Advisory Panel, the San Bernardino Superior Court Executive Committee representing Rancho Cucamonga, Chino, Joshua Tree, and San Bernardino Central District, and as the only judge on the domestic violence death review team for San Bernardino County. Throughout his career, Judge Pacheco has promoted civility, professionalism, and ethics in his courtroom, and by teaching civility matters through ABOTA, which is the American Board of Trial Advocates. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us, but don't miss it next week. Take care. This has been the Southern California Business Report with Daryl McCants and Yvette Walker on KMET 1490 AM ABC News Radio, a show dedicated to highlighting successful Southern California businesses and the people behind them. Log on to the show's website and remember to visit the podcast page.